Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, really, really, you, you probably don't know how glad I am to be here. I am to be here. Huh? And uh, we are going to be in the last of these sessions, in the last of this panel, and uh, we will try to be as good as the previous one because we have a fantastic panel, an outstanding panel just for you. Uh, Rama was saying before that uh, his mission is to put science into policy, and this is board. Uh, the mission of our panel is to do the fun job. Huh? The fun job is doing the science and try to put this science into action. And uh, this is what we offer to you today. Uh, I'm, I was the guy that started there, and I'm going to make the possibility to come here with me to Carlos Duarte, Mar uh, Mar professor of marine science of the King Abdullah University in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> this guy is one of the top five scientists in the area worldwide, so very good one. Ralph Chami, which is uh, uh, assistant director of the International Monetary Fund. Thank you, Ralph. And Thorsten Thiel, 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 that is the founder of the Global Ocean Trust. So what the panel is offering to you today is an approximation from science into financial economy. Uh, this is what we are going to, to say to you. So you can do this through policy or you can do this overcoming policy, but the real point is that we need science into action as soon as possible. But before to go into that, and I know that we are very compressed on time because Thorsten needs to take a, pl a plane uh, soon in the afternoon, so late in the afternoon, but uh, he needs to escape. Let me just say two things that I think that are important and uh, we're not enough stressed today. Um, at the very morning, Caselli, Professor Caselli said that uh, you are in a business school. We, we need to realize that we are just celebrating the Ocean Day in one of the best business schools in the world. And I don't know if you check it or not, but probably this has not been done before. It's the first time that a celebration of the Ocean Day probably occurs in a business school and should be more in the future about, about these issues. And he said, this is about school and about management. And I want to stress these two things very, very rapidly. From the point of view of a school, yeah, I, know, I know that this is, a, this is a, a semantic issue, but really, we are not in the blue economy today. The blue economy, this thing that we are talking rapidly this, today, is just an aspirational goal. What we have today in the world is an ocean economy that is not sustainable. We need to define the principles for sustainableize this ocean economy, and then we will talk about the blue economy. So the blue economy is a goal, and the schools of management need to pass this message. And from the point of view of management, the interesting thing that we have today, I think for me with this audience, is that you are mostly coming from the private sector. You are mostly coming from the private sector. And you need to enhance social well-being and economic prosperity, this positive impact that private sector needs to do. But at the same time, and this is new in the 21st century, and this is new in what needs to be done in the coming years, you need to maintain the integrity of the natural systems because these natural systems need to ensure the provision of ecosystem goods and services for all of us. So you need to help to make the earth resilient for all social ecological systems we have in the planet. So these things can be passed, urgently passed, from a business school, not just to the policy sector, but also to the private sector. So coming that very quick, uh, I think that what these guys prepare for you, it's fun, it's really fun. Carlos is going to talk about science and blue carbon, and then Ralph and Thorsten 
We'll talk about value. We will talk about value later, about the value of these stocks, of this natural capital that is going to be shown to you. But they will present some uh, presentations, and, and then we will come back into the dialogue. So, Carlos, you are the first. Welcome. And uh, I think the presentation is here. Uh, yes, uh, maybe I need to go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafa, for the introduction. And uh, also, thank you to uh, One Oceans for the invitation to be here. And congratulations on the event that has been organized to celebrate World Ocean Day. And also, the choice of venue in a business and management school, uh, Bocconi, one of the top in the world. So, I think it really brings the conversation to where it should be, which is how to create a new economy that is about investing in nature rather than take from nature. So this is what we're going to try to do today. And in fact, uh, I'm very happy to see the conversation being ra raised to uh, business schools and, and uh, hallmarks of economy. And uh, Ralph and I were uh, presenting uh, two weeks ago in the European Central Bank to the board, the councillors to the board, and the president of the bank. And just today in the Financial Times, there is a, a note from the European Central Bank on the importance of investing in nature. So this blue economy is slowly surfacing back to a level of conversation where the private sector can engage. And what I'm going to do in this duo presentation that uh, my colleague and friend Ralph Shami and I will do together is first to walk you through the concept of a blue natural capital in the context of nature-based solutions and then Ralph will tell you how we can create an economy around investing in nature. Uh, so um, there's been a lot of conversation already about uh, natural capital and uh, nature-based solutions in the meeting today. And also then we heard from the, uh, Her Excellency the Minister of the Marshall Islands on the importance of, uh, of the oceans for our own existence. So the benefits we receive from, from the oceans are many and none as important as uh, climate stability. So, uh, this is not uh, shifting. Oh, there. So, uh, climate stability in the Earth system used to be maintained uh, during thousands of years through a closed loop called the global carbon cycle. And the global carbon cycle is a closed loop through which uh, organisms, both on land and ocean, remove carbon through photosynthesis mainly, not only through photosynthesis, and they remove about 780 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year, which is uh, more than the 10 times the amount that is uh, uh, emitted by human uh, sources. And then that uh, material that is generated from photosynthesis then is able to support all of the processes in ecosystems, reproduction, growth, uh, movement, and eventually organisms, both on land and oceans, then take the energy that is contained in this organic material and release it back to use it to support their metabolism and energetic needs through the process of respiration. And then respiration returns back that carbon, uh, as carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And the balance between those two processes, uh, photosynthesis and respiration at the global scale is so well tuned that we can really resolve it by measurements if there is any any difference between the two, and we can use models to see if there is a slight little offset between one or the other component that also drive uh, small oscillations in carbon dioxide. But this uh, circular economy of carbon that has been maintained over tens of thousands of years by biology is really uh, what uh, maintains uh, climatic stability and is driven by natural capital. So natural capital is defined as the components of ecosystems, be it species or habitats or communities that support the processes that are essential to maintain human well-being, and none of them is as important as we're seeing now as climatic stability. So if we simplify the goals of the Paris Agreement, in Article 4, Paris Agreement pledges to achieve by mid-century an equilibrium between emissions of greenhouse gases and removal by sinks. So really what the Paris Agreement is about is to return human operations to be under the laws of nature. So we are going to generate a circular economy of carbon or greenhouse gases that is going to stabilize their concentration in the atmosphere. And that seems to be a very good uh, idea. 
So how do we do that? So there are multiple options to do that, and there's basically two domains where we can intervene. This is a, a model that uh, my colleague Bill McDonough and I produced uh, for the G20 uh, a few years ago. And really we have two areas of activity. One is the technosphere, which is the domain of human built uh, structures and materials, and the other one is the biosphere. So we can reduce emissions uh, by energy efficiency or by switching to renewables. We can also reuse and recycle uh, greenhouse gases to produce other materials, uh, but we also need to remove. We need to remove excess carbon dioxide that is already present in the atmosphere, and we can do it in two different ways. We can use it in the technosphere by using machines that remove carbon dioxide, or we can use it in nature. So that's in the left part of the figure, remove, and that's what we call nature-based solutions for climate change. So you see that it's a blue and a brown component in, a, in the remove part. So if we then zoom on this component of a climate action, which is nature-based solutions, then the way we define nature-based solutions is as an approach to decarbonize the atmosphere, so remove <coughs> excess carbon from the atmosphere, to recarbonize the biosphere. Because as mentioned earlier um, by Dr. Sylvia Earle, we have lost about half of the global uh, natural capital, both on land and the ocean, that was supporting all of this uh, work and the carbon cycle that maintain climatic stability. So we need to recover and uh, restore uh, ecosystems and functions both on land and ocean. So uh, nature-based solutions actually aim at rebuilding the abundance of life on land and oceans, and therefore to restore and regenerate the natural capital upon which our well-being uh, depends. So what is the scope for nature-based solutions? And uh, uh, almost in an ongoing basis, I found that when, when there's a forum where climate change is being discussed, the conversation rapidly goes into fossil fuel use. That's a big part of the problem, but not the only uh, component of the problem. And about 38% of accumulated greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere that are creating the problem actually do not come from emissions from uh, greenhouse gas combustion or uh, cement production. They actually come from destroying nature. And in carbon accounting, this has the very weird name of a, a land use change. And the, that name is weird because it's not about land alone. We have also destroyed and uh, damaged marine ecosystems. So it shouldn't be a land use change, it should be biosphere change. So here we need to claim the oceans into that uh, language as well. And if we look at, uh, at the scope for a uh, nature-based solution, so even uh, in 2022, when we have the last carbon budget uh, available, then 24% of emissions were not from a uh, uh, greenhouse, uh, sorry, from uh, fossil fuels, they were from uh, damages to ecosystems and nature. So it follows that if uh, 30, one third of the problem comes from damaging nature, if we repair nature, we can actually achieve one third of the climate action that we need. And that comes along with many, bene many benefits. But as I mentioned, the focus has been for many decades on forest and on land. And now we learn that there's a lot of opportunities to contribute to climate action through a blue natural capital in the ocean. So marine forest that uh, would be like seagrass, mangroves, and salt marshes, and kelp forests are the most intense carbon sinks in the biosphere. So based on uh, research that, uh, that myself and others did in the 90s and early part of the century, then uh, in 2009, I worked together with uh, uh, different agencies of the UN to uh, publish a report where we calculated the benefit of uh, conserving and restoring marine forest to climate action. And in fact, if we compare the champion of carbon removal on land, that will be the pristine Amazonian forest, with the champion of carbon removal in the ocean, which is your Posidonia meadows in the Mediterranean, uh, it follows that one hectare of Posidonia meadow in the Mediterranean is actually equivalent to about 17 hectares of pristine Amazonian forest in terms of the capacity to remove carbon. And there's one important difference between the two, and the important difference which I found when I was working early on on this, on this uh, opportunity that people on land were not really grasping, is that there are no fires underwater. So the carbon that these ecosystems accumulate, accumulate safely 
over thousands of years without going through the natural cycles of burning and returning to the atmosphere, which have been now accelerated by climate change-induced uh, forest fires. So these uh, grasses that we see in the photo, and that's in Spain, but you have beautiful Posidonia meadows in Sardinia, for instance, I was mentioned earlier, are really champions of climate action that we can uh, look at in terms of uh, catalyzing our activity. But sadly, we have also lost about half of the global extent of seagrass, mangroves, uh, and kelp forest, and salt marshes. So in 2009, as I mentioned, I worked together with different UN agencies to release this report called Blue Carbon, the role of healthy oceans in binding carbon, uh, where we put forward the strategy to uh, contribute to climate action by avoiding for future losses through conservation and also restoring these ecosystems. This is the first time that this term blue carbon was used and since it has become a mainstream focus of research and now also on investments. So on the Paris Agreement, uh, the major investment on blue carbon was announced at that time, 2015, by the French government and there was a 70 million US dollar investment in mangrove restoration in the Philippines. Every convention of the parties, every year, the number grows, and the largest uh, blue carbon projects now on the ground are in the order of more than five uh, billion uh, US dollars single projects. So from 2015 to now, to now, we've seen a 100 to approaching 1,000 fold increase in the investment in blue carbon because it's a strategy that works and it's a strategy that generates multiple benefits. So what are those benefits? So in addition to climate action, these ecosystems also uh, help uh, protect our shorelines. So they are very important to defend infrastructure, human lives, and also the beaches upon which, for instance, tourism depend. So we can actually also achieve uh, climate change adaptation. They also support fisheries. They improve the sanitation of waters and reduce enteric diseases that kill millions of ki children every year in developing nations because they keep the pathogens away from the water. They contribute to zero hunger because they uh, promote uh, fisheries, partnerships, uh, many, many SDGs that are, uh, that are supported by blue carbon uh, strategies. And therefore, there are no regret action. Whereas, for instance, if you remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere with the same amount with a machine, you actually remove carbon dioxide, then you need to find what to do with it because it's still carbon dioxide, so the problem is not removed. But if you remove it with nature, then what you get is more nature, which actually uh, reproduces itself, and you get all of these benefits in addition. So let's talk a bit about uh, food security because that's a very important uh, sustainable development goal. So in 2005, there were about 8,000 million people which were undernourished and at risk of dying from uh, hunger. Uh, and between then and 2015, progress was made and the global population at risk of hunger was reduced by about 30%. But unfortunately, due to disruptions such as uh, energy price, uh, war in Ukraine, and more recently now climate uh, disturbances with droughts and floods, then the number of people at risk of uh, severe undernourishment is actually greater than in 2005. So if we fail to achieve Sustainable Development Goal 2, none of the others matter. Because without, without a, a nourishment, you cannot support education, health, and any of the other goals. So this is a fundamental uh, failure of our approach to Sustainable Development Goals. And the link between this and blue carbon is the production of uh, marine food. And uh, I refer often to, uh, to uh, blue superfoods because uh, marine food is a food that is healthy for us, can be healthy for the planet and affordable. So we need foods with very low carbon footprints and very low water footprints, and those can only come from the ocean. So when you restore mangrove, restore Posidonia meadows, you're also contributing to alleviate hunger by enhancing the capacity of nature to produce food. But the most important development of blue carbon is that for the first time, nature marine uh, ecosystems are investable without having to extract from them. So during 2000 years, marine life had no value while still alive. For instance, a tuna swimming in the ocean had zero value, and it's only when you kill it and bring it to the market that had value. So with blue carbon, 
beyond climate action and the other sustainable de development goals, the paradigm shift that has been achieved is that for, for the first time there is investment in uh, repairing and uh, conserving marine ecosystems. So that really changes the conversation from a paradigm that was initiated in the Roman Empire with the Justinian uh, code that uh, coded um, uh, the oceans as terra nullis, that is no one's land. And that coding of the ocean as terra nullis is really the predicament that has brought about the depletion of resources in the ocean because it suffers from the tragedy of the commons. And the tragedy of the commons uh, affects all of that that is common, both uh, air, and that leads to the problem of climate change, and also uh, oceans. So for the first time, uh, we are, have an, uh, an opportunity to escape the tragedy of the commons that was already identified by Aristotle, but has been with us for 2,000 years because the ocean belonged to no one. And with blue carbon, but moving on to the new concept of blue natural capital, what I and Ralph and our colleagues wish to achieve is to transfer the oceans from being terra nullis to be terra omnis, everybody's land, so that we can all invest in healthy oceans and healthy nature, and that becomes a new asset. So uh, the path from blue uh, carbon to blue natural capital, it's a very important uh, event beyond the climate action because it's the first time that there is value in investing in nature in the ocean, right? On land, you could own a plot of forest and it has value without you having to log it. But in the ocean, until just a few years ago, the concept of blue uh, carbon, there was really no investment that you could make that was uh, eventually making sense in terms of uh, investing in marine life. So it was all, only philanthropy that was going into conserving marine life or sometimes public funding, but there was uh, no opportunity to invest in marine life. So uh, blue natural capital is a new asset class, and the challenge is how to turn this new asset class into a new value that can be brought to financial markets, allowing for opportunities for the private sector to invest in marine uh, natural capital, and Ralph is going to tell you how to achieve that. But uh, this is a quote from uh, a friend of mine, James Sternlich, that is the son of the founder of Starwoods uh, Hotels and owner of Starwoods Capital, that uh, he told me once in a vessel in the Bahamas where I was around with some uh, people in the audience that uh, natural capital is the new real estate. Because in the same way that you can own a building and rent it for many years and derive capital from renting the building, the owners of blue natural capital, which are the nations, the islanders for the, from the Marshall Islands and others, can now derive value from renting the services of the ecosystem, such as climate services. So I mentioned that blue natural capital is, is the components of ecosystems that support human well-being, and that is not only uh, plants and forests, but also animals can do that, and Ralph will tell us about this. But the important connection here is that no longer we have only one goal, which is a climate goal, but as mentioned earlier, the Cumin Montreal Biodiversity Framework uh, that was uh, agreed uh, by the Convention of Biological Diversity in December last year in Montreal is now referred to as the Paris, Ag Paris Agreement for Biodiversity. So it has many important elements, but it has a call to the colleagues in the Climate Convention to activate nature-based solutions to the maximum possible ambition because uh, nature-based uh, solutions not only contribute to climate action, but they also address the fundamental challenges of biodiversity conservation. And it's not just about 30 by 30. It's also about the ambitious goal of stopping all biodiversity losses by 2030, and also about restoring 30% of degraded ecosystems. Uh, right now, I've been in conversation with different governments around the world. None of them are really translating these goals into the financial resources required or the action required. They're thinking about 30 by 30, I mean, 30% of protected area, but not what it will it take to restore 30% of Madrid, uh, marine degraded areas. But just for corals alone, that might be 600 billion US dollars that will be required to achieve that goal for one component alone. So it's clear that governments alone cannot do it, and we need the participation of the private sector to invest in nature and be part of the solution on achieving these goals. So I, along with some colleagues, put together a framework uh, two years ago, uh, or three years ago now in the journal uh, Nature, 
on a pathway to rebuild marine life, and we pledge that it's possible to restore the abundance of marine life within the time span of one human generation. That is by 2050. That really requires a lot of actions, but we can do it. And it's a grand challenge that is also a very good business opportunity because we calculate that for every dollar investing, invested in rebuilding marine life, the economic return to markets is $10. And the main beneficiaries will be uh, the insurance sector, the seafood sector, and many others that can really derive benefits from a healthier ocean. And what we need to do is to connect these two uh, major uh, conventions, the Paris Agreement and the Kumi Montreal uh, Biodiversity Framework, and the connector between the two is actually natural capital. So natural capital connects our goals on climate and nature. And it also suggests how we need to manage land. We need to have protected areas, this 30%. We need to have heavily densely occupied areas like cities, like Milano. But then we need to also have more nature in areas that we share with nature and make those areas uh, functional ecosystems. So, I submit that what we may see during the 21st century is a paradigm shift mm -hmm. and uh, where planetary repair may be the goal of the fourth industrial revolution and repairing the planet is probably no longer a cost. It's actually an investment that generates returns and is going to generate uh, jobs that are meaningful jobs and is going to activate the economy and the outcome of this will not be a legacy of uh, factories that are abandoned and no longer useful the legacy of this fourth industrial revolution will be a vibrant nature that is able to support our well-being. Thank you. So, Ralph, you can go. Uh, thank you. can you. save some time, then we can cross them, yep, talk, and sure. then we can be back to no you. Problem. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rafa. Thank you, uh, One Ocean, and thank you all for coming. Um, so my job here is to, is to argue for how we could build an economy around uh, blue capital. And, uh, and it's fitting to be here in a business school to talk about it because I'm going to talk about the business of building an economy. From, but the question is where do we start this conversation? Just to recap what uh, my colleague Car Carlos talking about, we are facing twin risks. Let's remind ourselves. Uh, and there the twin risks are materializing um, due to human activity. Now those that work on climate change believe that the solution is through carbon reduction of emissions and um, grabbing carbon from the atmosphere. And those that work on nature believe that the way to reduce the risk to nature and loss of biodiversity is by uh, protecting nature, allowing it to rejuvenate. Question is, we need to do both at the same time because we are in the 11th hour and we are running out of time. Question is, how are we gonna do so? Oh, here's a solution, as Carlos was talking about. Um, if you're in the climate uh, team, you, you think the way to go through to solve the climate issue again is through the reduction in emissions. I call that closing the tap, the tap that's dripping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But if you come through it from the nature side, as Carlos is doing, you realize very quickly that it's not really only about uh, shutting off the tap, but you need to drain the tub. They simply put, we have a problem of stock and flow. There's a flow of emissions into the atmosphere. If today all of us were to shut off that valve, all of us go to emissions zero, we're still going to bake to death because the, the carbon that has accumulated in the atmosphere will continue to warm up the earth. So we need two solutions. We have two objectives. We have two, ob we have two solutions. Um, and one is to shut off the valve and to drain the tub. And draining the tub is really where nature-based solutions come in because they're the ones who are gonna help us drain the, grab the, the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as Carlos was talking about. Okay, so we have the solution. What to do? Invest in nature, you protect nature, and nature boomerangs back by grabbing carbon for us from the atmosphere. So we know what to do. Question is, how are we going to do it? Well, Carlos just explained to us that the oceans are the carbon sink, whether the phytoplankton grab carbon or be it closer to shore, salt marshes, mangroves, seagrass, these are all living bodies that grab carbon 
on uh, behalf of humanity. And of course, the open ocean, the orphan that belongs to no one and therefore belongs to everyone, has been grabbing carbon since time immemorial. Uh, but let's not forget that it's not only about fauna, but also flora. Flora, be it on land or be it in the sea, they also play a role in grabbing carbon from the atmosphere, uh, for example, the elephants, and that's the work of Fabio Berzaghi, who is sitting somewhere in the audience here, who showed that the elephants help to sequester carbon in the forest by at least 14%. And also, if you like, the, the whales, the, the, great, uh, the great whales also help to sequester carbon in the oceans. This is the latest paper by Oswald Schmidt and, and uh, Fabio Berzaghi and others showing the nine trophic animals that help in the fight against climate change. So the lesson here is nature can, can help us fight climate change, but nature, not only trees, and not only just the uh, vegetation in the ocean, but it's nature, and fauna and flora interacting with each other, creating this beautiful web of life that helps us to fight climate change and rebalance our lives. So science, up to here, science is saying, this is what Carlos is saying, science is telling us nature is incredibly valuable. It's valuable, it's invaluable intrinsically, and, and, and it's also invaluable to our own existence. Question is, can we value, can we value this intrinsic value of nature? Can we put it in a language that we've chosen for ourselves in market econ uh, economies, which is uh, the language of dollars and cents? And the answer is, Yes, we can do so, because uh, there's a, the nature, for example, through one service alone, grabbing of carbon, we can go back to that service and value it. Why? Because there is the price for carbon. Using the price for carbon, we can go back and look at the, nat the service that each natural asset is actually producing and value their services. So we can go back into the ocean and, and ask, you know, and figure out how much does a whale, what is the value of the carbon sequestration by a whale, okay? And if you were to do this exercise, you'd come up with at least $2 million per whale. That would be the expected discounted present value, the lifetime earnings of a whale just from sequestering carbon. Same thing, uh, this is work we did with Fabio. Uh, we looked at what is the value of the carbon sequestration by the elephants. In the, in the Congo Basin, and that's at least $1.75 million per living uh, uh, elephant. We can do the same thing with the vegetation in the ocean. These are examples of projects we, we've had. In Florida mangroves, you can see it's 1.6 million. Salt marshes in England, 1.5 million per square kilometers. And this is work with Carlos, uh, who taught us, basically, <laughs> that uh, seagrass does something really cool. It grows exponentially for 50 years and continues to grow at a constant rate forever. Imagine, just imagine if you could invest in a company that will grow exponentially for 50 years and continues to grow forever. What would be the value of that company? Over a trillion dollars. So seagrass alone just from carbon sequestration is worth over a trillion dollars. So nature, science tells us nature is valuable we can value it in dollars and cents and, and figure out that it's incredibly valuable. So you would think because nature is so valuable financially, money must be coming in hand over fist to invest in nature. And the answer is unfortunately not, not. Uh, this uh, diagram is to show you how little money is coming into the protection of nature, although it's incredibly valuable. And the only money that you see here is philanthropic money. And you can see how little it is and we have a financing gap. If we want to protect nature, re help nature rejuvenate, we really need about $700 billion per year. Now, where, where is it gonna come from? Well, you can, I can stand here and ask you to contribute some more money, but you're not gonna get more than that. Or we can go to the governments and besiege them to give us more money, and they're not gonna give us money because they have other things that they're in interested in. So where's the money gonna come from? The proposition in front of you here is that since we're in a business school, we're gonna make an investment um, proposition. We're going, to, uh, we're going to show you that we can, you can actually invest in nature, not philanthropically, not out of altruism, purely out of value proposition. So let me show you how we're gonna do this. So on the left-hand side, um, you see the potential buyers of services of nature. Let's say it's about carbon. So on the left-hand side, 
There are companies that have made pledges to go carbon zero, carbon negative, carbon neutral, and they need to purchase carbon uh, uh, sequestration from some, someone that uh, has the technology that will sequester carbon. On the right hand side would be those owners of natural assets, mangrove, seagrass, salt marsh, if you like trees on land too. Now what I put for you here is, I'm a, I'm a financial economist, so, and I've worked in financial market development for 30 years. What are the issues that we need to solve if we want to bring investors into this space? What would an investor want to know? So the first thing an investor, so if you're asking someone to come in and invest in blue carbon, the first thing that the investor is going to ask you is tell me about the future. Tell me about, you want me to buy your, the carbon of your seagrass. Tell me about how much carbon is your seagrass going to grab today, tomorrow, next year, the year after, for the next 10 years, because you want my money today. So I need to, you need to tell me something about the future. Can we project the, the carbon sequestration of a living system? <clears throat> the second problem that you need to solve to bring investment forward is who owns that asset? We're used to trading assets on land, but now you're talking about assets in the water. Do you own the seagrass? If you want to sell me the carbon of the seagrass, do you own it? The third problem is, well, I'm Microsoft, and you want me to invest in the carbon of the seagrass of Bahamas, but I'm in Seattle, and, this, and the asset is sitting in the Bahamas. How do I know that that asset is being looked after? I don't want to take the word of the government with all due respect. I need someone to verify the words of the government. Okay, that's, we, in economics, we call it solving a problem of asymmetric information. The other problem that we face is what we call this time consistency. When you are buying, remember, we wanna bring investment forward. So you wanna take my money today for the next five, 10 years. How do I know that you as a buyer, as a seller, well, you won't change your mind and you replace the asset with a marina? Suddenly you decide, well, I don't want to see any more seagrass. Let's build a marina. And, but I've given you my money today. So how are you going to solve that problem? How do you make it really negotiation proof? The fifth one really is a problem not really for us, but for the whole world. Uh, we're looking at what, when you look at, the, at what's going on all around us, there are multiple prices for the same molecule of carbon, multiple definitions of the same thing, and it really is not helpful in, in, in actually forming a market. So let me show you quickly how we can solve each of these problems. This is work that we've done in the Cayman Islands. We sat with the scientists and we said, how, does the, how, how do the mangroves grab carbon? And they told us, well, mangroves grab carbon, you know, in terms of vertically, carbon per centimeter, and then that, that, uh, the asset itself grows over time at a certain rate. You use the chain rule and they, you can get on the right-hand side how carbon is gonna grow over time. So if you have that graph, I can tell you in expectations how much carbon the mangroves in the fringe area in the, in, uh, in the Cayman Islands, how much you should expect as an investor in terms of carbon flows over the next 10, 20, 15 years. Um, this is based on the work of Carlos. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see how the seagrass grows exponentially for 50 years and at a constant rate forever. Well, if you know this and you know, and you know how the, you, know, you have the data, we can build nonlinear projection models, which is on the right-hand side, which be, be more or less uh, mimic reality with the confidence bounds. So you can calculate the standard deviations around the model estimates and around the, the empirical estimates. And I can, once I have that, then I, can, then, then I can go to the investor and say, you should expect, if you, if you want to invest in seagrass, so much carbon in for the next 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years, of course, as you go further into the future, the standard deviations are going to be greater. This is work that Carlos and I and colleagues here from Beneath the Waves are doing in the Bahamas. Bahamas, due to the work of Carlos and Beneath the Waves, this is Nature article, uh, is sitting on 30% of the total mass of seagrass in the world. Now imagine, I just told you, seagrass in the world is worth a trillion dollars. So the Bahamas is sitting on 30% of it. Uh, potentially, the Bahamas then could be the richest country per capita on the face of the planet. Okay, um, and the question, so this, this is, uh, if, you know, remember potentially. So potentially Bahamas is sitting on $170 billion. Question is, how do we materialize that? Well, it's not enough to project. We need to know 
do you own the asset? Right? Does Bahamas own the seagrass? And what the Bahamas government did, they said, yeah, we do. And they published these two reports. And they said, anything that is blue or green belongs to us. So if you want to buy carbon, you deal with me directly. No ambiguity. So if I'm an investor, now I have, I know, you know, we, can, we have the models that can project how much carbon the seagrass of the Bahamas can, can produce into the future. And we know that if we want to buy those, there's only one entity to deal with, which is the government of the Bahamas. Done. Okay. <clears throat> so, but notice what happens from, from a financial point of view, because we're in a business school. This point is very important. Okay. People confuse two, con I hear this all the time, and I'm a financial economist. They, they say um, um, natural capital or natural asset. These two are not the same. A natural asset is not natural capital. For an asset to become capital, it has to be codified in the law. When it's codified in the law, then it enters your balance sheet. Then it changes your net worth. Then the gain starts. So to, when you codify it in the law, for example, in the case of the Bahamas, they said, this asset belongs to us. Boom. That means now we can value it. Now it goes on their balance sheet. Now it changes the net worth of the Bahamas, changes their, their debt sustainability. It changes the ratings for the whole country. So now you can talk about a new class of assets, a new source of wealth. Now, resolving the information problem. So I am, remember, I'm Microsoft, and, and I want to invest in the carbon of the Bahamas, but how do I know that some, they're, t they're taking good care of my, of my asset? Well, so let's say Microsoft is on the left, is going to pay money for the services. You're not buying the asset. You're buying the services of the asset. Could be mangrove, seagrass, salt marshes, whatever. And the money is supposed to go to look after the asset in perpetuity and to look after the stewards of nature, indigenous people, local communities. So how do I know that the asset is doing well? Well, guess what? Technology is here. We have now satellite technology. We have sensors in the water. Really, we've come a long way. And that will tell me that the asset is doing great. Now, how do I know that the money is going to the people that's supposed to go? That's using blockchain technology. Blockchain will ensure that, you know, we know two sides to the, to the contract, that there's no double counting. We know exactly what's happening. And more importantly, the local communities will be in charge because they'll get to see who they're dealing with, who's buying the asset, who's buying the services of their asset. And if you are Microsoft and you manage to do all of this, look what happens to you. You not only are getting carbon, but you're getting, by investing in the seagrass of the Bahamas, you're investing in sea turtles, as I learned from Carlos, and you're investing in the, in the health and wealth of the APEC, the APEC predator, which is the tiger shark. So now you're talking about not carbon credits, but you're talking about biodiversity Within credits. 10 minutes, so and because healthy seagrass means healthy fish stock and, 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 and defense against flooding, suddenly Microsoft is Sorry, getting SDGs 1, 3, 8, 10, 13, 14, 15, now they get to put it on their website that they're a fantastic corporation. It's not about offsetting their carbon. They're investing in nature. They're reducing poverty. They're creating employment. They're stabilizing people in their land. Wonderful story. Now, the, fifth, the fourth problem we have to solve, which is the government makes a commitment, and how do I make sure they don't change their mind a year later? Well, we, what we advocate is creating something like a, a, a nature wealth fund. And the all the money from the sale of the carbon goes into that fund. It's an endowment fund. The stock of it belongs to the government, which means it goes on their balance sheet. But the flow, which is the income side, is under strict governance. This flow does not belong to the government. It sits, the governance of it sits outside and ensures that the money that Microsoft is paying is indeed going to look after nature in perpetuity and the stewards of nature. This is more, I'm almost done. Um, I'm, I'm seeing the evil eye from the side. <laughs> uh, and this is basically, what I, it's a plea really for everybody because when we look at what's happening in the carbon markets, we have prices all over the place. If you're the global south and you're trying to sell carbon, you get $5, $10, $20 if you're in good shape. But big corporations are buying carbon from a carbon capture machine, imagine. Carbon capture, and they're paying $1,200 a ton. Why? It's the same molecule. Why are you paying $1,200 for a machine? But when a country comes and says, I have nature, 4 billion year old technology, you pay me 10 bucks or 20 bucks. 
It's not helpful. It's not going to lead us to fight climate change, and it will continue to, to divide us as time is running out. So we need global governance, and perhaps that is a hint to my institution that I just retired from, the IMF, to basically um, take the charge and, and harmonize definitions and even the pricing of carbon so, because time is really running out. Now, if you were to do all this, we're, I'm done, I promise. Uh, look at the benefits that you would get. If you're a country that is managing to sell the services of living nature, you never sell, you never sell nature, look at all these benefits. You're diversifying your revenue, you're, it's a new source of wealth, you, your, your environment is protected because you're looking after your nature. Creating resilience in nature creates resilience in people. When nature is resilient, people don't have to leave their land. We will avoid people on the move, as, as we're seeing is happening all over the world. Finally, when you reach this, what we call the nature-based solution, or an economy with nature and people at, at its core, look how wonderful it is. On the left-hand side, the government that has the nature and sells its services, it's gonna see its fiscal stance enhanced, it diversifies the economy, that revenue, by the way, is acyclical. It does not depend on tourism, does not depend on the business cycle, does not depend, God forbid, another COVID may come around. And as I said before, the buyer of biodiversity or carbon credits gets not only the carbon credits, not only enhances ESGs, but they get SDGs, 1, 3, 8, 10, 13, 14, 15. Who else wins? The indigenous populations the local communities win. And of course, nature wins. So in this new paradigm that Carlos and I are talking about, there are no losers. This idea of a win-lose proposition has really been devastating to us. This paradigm says everybody is a winner, but we win by investing in a living and thriving nature for nature itself and for its people. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ralph. Uh, we are really, really in a hurry. Thor Thorsten needs to leave us in five minutes, so sorry, Thorsten, it, but uh, if you can send them. That, that's no problem at all, because I'm so honored and privileged to follow these amazing <laughs> thinkers who are really showing us this new paradigm, mm -hmm. this ability to do finance based on science. It's evidence-based finance that takes nature fully into account. And so what my work's been focusing on is working with the various actors we have out there in today's world to try to get them ready for what we are talking about in this broad transition, which is really to show that some of the impacts of finance on the ocean today don't have that evidence that they are nature positive. So the finance has to be moving away from that. That is a big transition to finance. That these risk components need to be fully taken on board, and that we have this new opportunity, this new vision that will allow us to help develop at every level ocean solutions. So we've written about that, you heard about that, we've developed test projects around blue natural capital through the IOCN Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility. We have um, tried to show how this transition to a sustainable blue economy affects both the traditional marine sectors, but also a whole range of emerging sectors around the bioeconomy, around resilience and restoration. All this work to actually do the work on the ground for blue natural capital means there are new opportunities for companies to do that. But then also, as we heard this morning, there are a whole range of existing sectors that are much more connected to the ocean than they were tr traditionally aware of. And therefore, as they start to engage, as they start to in understand the, the connectivity, they can play part of that transition. And uh, so we set up um, the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance as a way, for instance, to bring the large insurance and financial sector in connection with local projects, with these processes to make this transition. So this is an ongoing process. And it helps that we are working on this change of this global ocean governance regime, as you heard already. This goes beyond um, what is done at a local and regional level. It's a whole 
ocean sea basins approach and it includes the high seas work on finance of which I've been working. So when we wrote the panel on finance, the blue paper for the ocean panel, we identified seven key areas for the finance sector and only one of it is about the money flow itself. It's a lot about the, the enabling conditions. And the IFC has now picked up on this, developed its own guidelines for blue finance. We are, and this is really the core of what we are saying, working simultaneously on millions, billions and trillions. So we need the work on the ground, on projects, on impact investment, on how to engage with grants and equity. We need this big transition towards billions that brings in the development banks, that thinks around coastscapes, that has structures that are accessible to debt type financing. But what we're really doing at the same time is shift the global financial mindset. And that's really the world of trillions. And that's these international registries. It's a way of engaging the global capital markets with the ocean. And that's why your engagement, the European Central Bank, the world work we did with the Basel um, institution around regulatory risk and helping financial institutions to understand and assess this risk is so crucial. And we have the new global biodiversity framework. It does provide specific opportunities to develop innovative finance for sustainable use. It has a target around finance. We have been in all week in discussions around how to implement capacity building around these opportunities. I'll talk tomorrow for the CBD on this topic. Um, and this idea that nature is infrastructure, that infrastructure finance is one of the biggest flows we have. We're talking about close to 100 trillion over the next two decades. If we spend that in the wrong way, we have a real problem if we redirect those flows aligned with nature and ocean. We don't have to add money, we're just spending money wisely. And uh, so this is what we talked about as integrated <coughs> nature-based solutions that deliver coastal resilience that are part of blue infrastructure. So let's be bold. We can achieve these goals right now through a coalition of the willing with strict price points, high quality compliance markets and a science-based approach. This goes beyond the national waters into the high seas, which is obviously most of the ocean. And I will leave it there. The sustainable blue economy is really the message for everybody to engage with this transition. And blue finance has a whole range of tools around blended finance, public-private partnerships, and metrics and monitoring that allow us to deliver this sea change towards a nature-based view of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dorchen. I know that you, you need to leave us immediately. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a little bit pressure for us because uh, we knew that uh, this uh, Dorchen needed to leave. Uh, but, uh, well, anyway, now we, have, uh, we are in a much more relaxed environment and we, uh, we can spend some time just trying to do some kind of dialogue and questions. Um, one thing that I, I should not be so much stressed during the, the day today, and it's related with something that Carlos said about the food security, is that um, 10 years ago when people were talking in Johannesburg about the concept of the blue economy, they defined this concept in the blue economy with issues that can be assimilated today what, uh, about what we deal with uh, a carbon neutral, nature positive world that has been said many times during this session. But we are sometimes forgetting something that the, the person that brought us uh, the Nepal problem today was just heavily saying, even the, the person from the Marshall Islands, which is, we need to develop also an equitable world. 
And the social environment in this particular issue is sometimes like forbidden. And we need to discuss about that uh, we live in a social ecological system and as important is to have a carbon neutrality and nature positive as it is to have an equitable world for everyone. So this is something that also we need to, we need to think. And, and I guess because you repeated constantly uh, and we are in Bocconi University, I would like to, to, to hear your arguments to, uh, Professor Caselli probably is not here, but we have uh, Francesco Perrini, we have Stefano Poguc, which are leading MBAs. The importance to have, for example, a kind of course, executive education even, for the financial analysis and to understand what means this concept of payment for ecosystem services. So what you will tell them uh, around this issue? Uh, in fact, uh, Carlos and I have been discussing this for quite a while. Um, uh, but just, just to segue back to the, the concept of equity. Um, market systems are about, I'm, I'm a neoclassical economist, um, is about efficiency. If you want equity, you have to bake it into the system. You have to bake it. Um, and so what, what we're talking about, if you notice in one of the slides, we need to ensure equity. And when you talk about equity, is not about only the current generation, but also about equity towards nature itself. So the idea of a nature wealth fund is to ensure equity towards nature into the future. And of course, when you have a fund and you are keep in ensuring that the fund looks after nature in perpetuity, you're also thinking of the future generations. So you have to design the markets with that in mind. So you start with that as a concept, and then you see how you use the market system to ensure that you have, that these, these, uh, these systems are actually viable financially. The beauty of bringing this into a finance world, I'm a financial economist, is uh, we call this work, by the way, science-based finance. Uh, the pillar is science. It starts with being grounded in the science. And then uh, when Carlos or Fabio here basically show us how the systems work, then we are, I'm a theoretical modeler, we can, we can model those systems. Uh, but now, so what happens, for, the result of it is you find out that you're no longer talking about linear systems, you're talking about nonlinear systems. Uh, and, and because think of just seagrass alone itself. Imagine, just imagine that you have a company that grows exponentially for 50 years. I remember seeing your, your paper and I'm, I was astounded. <laughs> I had to call him to say, is this for real? You have an asset that actually grows exponentially for 50 years and then continues to grow at a constant rate forever. And so what you do is imagine the cash flows of such a system uh, growing exponentially. So we can build a whole curriculum around taking the finance curriculum and, and bringing into it the sciences. And, and then we rejig the, the, the curriculum around valuing the services of a living nature. We already know the services of a dead nature, right? We know, if I tell you what's the value of a tree, well, cut it down, sell it as timber. But what is the value of a tree that's living for itself? There actually is a value to it. We just use carbon because there's a carbon market. Okay, but pretty soon we're gonna have biodiversity markets and, th and biodiversity credits will be traded and therefore we can actually calculate the value of a living tree not only from the carbon side from, but from other ecosystem services. It's just that for some of these ecosystem services we do not have the prices right now but they're coming. There's already work, many people are working on it. So we can think of how to bring into the business school, if you like, or into the finance curriculum, the, the, the side of the sciences, uh, valuing nature, a living nature, but we have to ensure that since we're talking about nature, that the issues of equity are very important. What I worry about, because I'm in the market myself, is the, what we call the carbon cowboys. What's happening right now is investment banks have figured out that this is really a money maker and they've, uh, brokers are out there in the world but trying to buy the asset itself. So when, we've, when we work with communities, we always tell communities never sell the asset because you just don't know what is the true value of your asset. 
right? So if you're talking about seagrass, we know the value of the carbon sequestration of the seagrass. But as I've learned from Carlos, uh, seagrass is a great defense against flooding. That has a value. And it's also when you have healthy seagrass, you have healthy fish stocks. So what is the value of seagrass? Well, you have to add up the cash flows from all of these different valuations. For some of them, we know the market value. For some of them, we don't know the market value. As a result, we always tell communities, do not sell the asset. Retain the ownership, but sell the services of the asset. Just one, one comment from my side, and is that uh, if you want to take one message from my contribution to the panel, that message should be that it's not about carbon. It's about the whole package, which is natural capital. So carbon-centric approaches to investing in nature are going to lead us and have led to make major errors. And we are seeing even a, a crisis in a carbon credits and verification agencies because uh, it's not just about carbon, it's about natural capital. So somehow we need to bundle the value of biodiversity along with the carbon. So we start with the carbon because we have a value that is coded on in the market, so it's investable. But now we need to find a way to value biodiversity. That is a challenge, uh, but we're working on it and we hope to uh, resolve it. And eventually the private sector is already ready to invest in biodiversity credits. So if we have a metric and that metric is codified and has a generally agreed uh, market value. So that's where it's missing to make natural capital investable. And then to make, uh, to bring the comment of uh, Ralph on the three bit nature uh, on the ocean. So uh, here we have the Pochidonia Meadows in the Mediterranean. So some years ago, I think it was 2006, I believe. Then we found the Pochidonia Meadow in Formentera Island in Spain. That is the uh, longest lived organism in the biosphere. So we calculated the age of that uh, plant which is now extending over 10 kilometers in size. Uh, so the time elapsed since the uh, seed that generated that plant and the time at which we sampled the plant was 200,000 years. So that is the longest lived organism on the planet. And colleagues uh, of mine in Australia have now uh, measured a clone of seagrass in Australia that extends over 380 kilometers. So that these are the, long, the largest organisms in the planet. They grow exponentially because they are clonal. So that's something that my, when I was starting to write papers about blue carbon, uh, people working on land did not understand what I was talking about. And I realized there were two major obstacles. The first one was simple, but yet it seemed to be a, a problem. That is that there are no fires underwater, so they got that. The second one is that when you plant three trees on land, at the end of 30 years, you may end up with one living tree, the other two might have died. But when you plant three seagrass in the ocean, after 30 years, you have about 10 billion seagrass because of the exponential nature of clonal growth. So really to invest in nature, we just need, need to prime nature because uh, nature then enters in a spiral of bounty. So the more elephants you have, the more baby elephants you're going to have, the more seagrass you have, the more seeds are you going to have. So that spiral of bounty is not one that happens with carbon removal machines. You need to build every single one of them. And nature uh, is a wonderful material that adapts to changing conditions and repairs itself. There is no other material that is as wonderful as nature. So let's invite in nature, in, invest in nature. Uh, I, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, thank you, Ralph. Um, the, the the, the paper Carlos showed show us in 2020, the one about rebuilding marine life, it was a kind of very provocative, uh, very provocative paper and uh, very making a lot of positive, saying a lot of positive things about how we can rebuild, rebuild nature. But we need to realize that the contributions to the benefits that we get from nature to people is enormous. So if we start to talk about this issue, Putting a value, a value, a price, uh, that matter, a value from this nature to us will serve us to change the mind. And this is what I think that uh, business schools need to realize, uh, that there is a difference between value and prices and, mo and money. Um, coming back to another complete different question, because uh, this, this morning 
uh, in one of the presentations at the very beginning, the guy from, I don't remember the name, sorry, the person from UNESCO that was talking to us uh, put f five actions that we should do in order to start to work with the blue economy. And uh, I was captured by the, I, I guess that it was not in, in order, no? but I was captured that the protection and restoration of habitats was occupying the fourth place and the fifth was tourism and there was three on top. So my question to you is that um, we have a convention on climate change, Paris Agreement, we have uh, a convention on biodiversity, the global biodiversity framework, we have the high treatises, now we need to put these goals, these objectives and goals into programs. So my question to you, it's a very difficult question, I guess, but maybe not. Huh? Uh, what would be your priorities? What would be your priorities for people, policy, private business? What do you be the priorities today with these goals in order to be real? What, what we need to do first? So maybe I take on that first and then hand over to Ralph. But I'm going to make a connection to discussions that happened in the day uh, earlier. One of them was talking about new uh, propulsion engines for vessels that are electric or even uh, generating hydrogen and things like that. So I, I believe what we need to do is to have a far more ambitious uh, goal for new ocean technologies. So in the UN Ocean Decade for uh, uh, Science, then I'm really appalled to see that there is not a single one strong component on, on technology. And as a an, uh, scientist, I've been working for 40 years in the ocean, the equipment that I use still looks the same as it was 40 years ago. Scuba diving and the, uh, uh, the instruments that we use to profile temperature, still the same. There has been zero progress and zero ambition. But just consider that uh, um, Jules Verne wrote a book that was 20,000 leagues of undersea voyage. That was, I believe, 1872. And in that book, he imagined a future in fact, it was in the present, but Im imagine a fictional world in which uh, the ocean could provide resources in a sustainable uh, way. Food and so on, and uh, Captain Nemo was selling the ocean in a submarine called uh, Nautilus. That submarine was actually propulsed by electric motors. Uh, it just consider that electricity was a concept yet. There were no batteries, but he imagined a submersible that was propulsed by electric motors and where the energy came from the hydrolysis of seawater and was stored in batteries. A 1872, you know when the hydrolysis of seawater as a source of power has been uh, published? Two years ago. So it has taken us a hundred years to take that dream and turn it into reality because we accept the status quo. So we cannot accept the status quo about the ocean and then uh, what we did in that paper is to imagine a different future. So all of the futures that we are presented with for nature and, and the climate system are very negative dystopic futures, you know, horrible futures, um, with the intent that, you know, if we don't want to go to those horrible futures, we need to do something else. But we are never presented with a positive future of nature and the ocean. And if we don't have that positive future, we don't know where to walk to. So, uh, uh, um, one, one of the Stoic philosophers said that the impediment to action advances action. It was Marco Aurelius. And what stands in the way becomes the way. So if we imagine a positive future for the ocean that we want to achieve, then, then the fact that we imagine it, as my friend uh, Bill McDonough says, is once you design something, it doesn't start to exist. Then you need to map what are the obstacles to reach there, and then you work to solve the obstacles, because the value of science is that we can redefine the limits of the possible through science. So, but we just need to know where we're heading to. So my recommendation to that is we need to raise our ambition for the oceans, because our lack of ambition for the ocean is pathetic, and is what really underlies the fact that it's the less invested uh, sustainable development goals of them all. Uh, before to go, Ralph, let, let me say something. First, you, Captain Nemo, it came to myself uh, this morning, I don't know who was talking about trading, and uh, say, we trade. 
well, natural traits. If you remember Nemo, not Captain Nemo, Nemo, the one of the Disney movie, and uh, this guy is trading with the anonymous just because uh, they, they exchange some, some, some kind of some ability. So uh, trading is also part of nature too. Um, but uh, that was in 2020, the paper of Carlos and collaborators was the kind of ocean optimism. But the same, the same year, there was a paper that I, I would define the ocean realism. And the ocean realism today is that there is plenty of demands for space in the ocean. Uh, this energy transition is putting all energy utilities, most of the energy utilities into the ocean. And this, we have the trade-off. So uh, in this trade-off, again, one needs to be prioritized, conservation, restoration, or the usage of. So um, let me pick up on the last point you mentioned. Conservation was always a cost proposition. So when we didn't have a value for a living nature, uh, if you talk to people that are involved in conservation, you, uh, they will think of it as a cost proposition, meaning, uh, well, um, you know, uh, around Christmas time, people approach you and say, w would you give me money to protect the cheetahs or the bonobos or the elephants or, or, uh, you know, or the salt marshes? It was always viewed from a cost proposition. What we're talking about here, when you realize that a living nature is an asset, Conservation is no longer a cost proposition. It's a revenue proposition because it becomes an asset. And if you have an asset, you definitely want to protect it because it's generating revenue. So this paradigm flips conservation on its head. But let me go back to something you mentioned. Look, uh, my mom was a professor and she used to say, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Implement now, perfect later. We know enough now, science, that a living nature is by being intrinsically valuable is financially valuable to us. That's my job. I take the science and I put it in dollars and cents. So let's get on with the business. What are we waiting for? I mean, what, what are we all waiting for? Someone, I mean, some ma magical force from heaven to say, say start. In, be, why? Because we are in the 11th hour. If you believe that, if, if you look at the IPCC reports, you know, it was 2050, the day of reckoning, now 2040, now in the next seven years, we're running out of time. So if we want the science to be perfect, that means we are witnesses to a crime. Let's get on with the business. The reason I pitched it to the, to the investment community, because I, after 25 years at the IMF, dealt with ministers, presidents, governments, you name it, I gave up on the politicians. Uh, the, in, the investment sector has trillions of dollars sitting, and right now they all want to come into the space. But you need to speak their language to come into the space. You cannot speak your language and expect them to understand what you're talking about. So when, when Carlos was writing, was writing for his fellow scientists, my job is to take that and, and talk to the, to the investors, to the policymakers, and the price is just to make an invisible nature visible. In a market system, if you don't have a price, you're viewed as invisible. And if you're invisible, that means people can cut you down, pollute you, just kill you with impunity. But once you have a number, you have a price, you're visible. So what we can do is we can invest in nature. That's one. Now, globally, if you're asking what should be done on a global level, meaning what should the IMF, World Bank, UN, all these things, what their job is to be is to be the conveners and the harmonizers of all these different definitions and all these different prices. Because having multiple prices for the same molecule does not help. Having multiple definitions of the same good doesn't help. I worked on the Basel Accord for the IMF for 20 years. The world met in Basel 1987 because they were worried about the banks, the big banks, competing by reducing their capital, the amount of capital they have. So the world decided, no, we cannot have that because then we'll have a global disaster. So they decided what would be the definition of capital and what would be the minimum level of capital that banks have to hold. Why don't we convene the world again and say every country has to have the same definition yeah. of natural capital and by the way, there should be a one price for the same molecule. It is not right that the global south gets $5 for a ton of carbon, 
where a big company, I'm not going to name, in the US is purchasing carbon from a carbon capture machine that is two years old <laughs> for $1,200 per ton. Is this right? Is this equitable? Is this how we converge on the fight against climate change? So there are certain things we can do. We do not have the luxury of time to make things perfect. We can perfect them. As we all know, science is cumulative. Knowledge is cumulative. Nobody gets it right the first time. We all learn, but we need to, as we're all saying, we need to get on with the business. Yeah, but, but let me put your question about space competition in context. So agriculture has converted 60 million square kilometers of land for food production and pasture and so on. If we look in the ocean and we look at the vegetable production in the ocean, that is seaweed farming, the total global area is 2,000 square kilometers, which is nothing, right? And that is a crop that is regenerative because it uh, is a crop that contributes to climate action, produces food, enhances biodiversity, injects oxygen in the water and provides shelter from ocean acidification. So I believe that if we give nature a value, marine life a value, any uh, claim to uh, operate in the ocean space that must have a requirement for that industry to be regenerative, like seaweed farming is. And if you harm the assets, then you have to pay a penalty. So I think there will be also a possible market uh, mechanism to balance the space allocations on the ocean, but the ocean is vast and enormous. And for instance, for seaweed farming, we're only using 2,000 square kilometers. The total area in Europe is less than one square kilometer of seaweed farms. Okay, so we need to go just finishing. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to understand we need to understand nature, the value of nature, our dependence with nature, and I want to finalize with a clear message. We are not in the 20th century. We are not in this moment in which we can consider business and nature. We are in the 21st century with a lot of things pressuring us. And this moment, in this moment, for all of us, for all the policies, for all the private sector, business is taking place in nature. If nature does not work well, business are not going to work well. So again, it's a kind of message to the business schools. They need to say that clearly. Thank you very much for, for, for you, your explaining. Thank you very much, Ralph, Carlos, and I think the end is coming now. <laughs>